بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we will now uh, continue from where we left off last time uh, and we were supposed to do the uh, election of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the the game plan is as follows that uh, typically speaking Sira finishes not with the death of the Prophet but with the election of Abu Bakr and the sending of Usama's caravan or the Usama's expedition to Syria <clears throat> because these things of course are related to uh, immediately related to the death of the Prophet Sallallahu and so we just to be full and complete we really do need to go into uh, these uh, these issues and then after that inshallah we will start talking about the wives of the Prophet and the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of course the issue uh, of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what happens afterwards is extremely controversial between two strands of Islam and this is where of course the Sunni Shia split begins and you cannot talk about this issue without mentioning both sides and that's really what all of this controversy is about so uh, today uh, I will be talking about one particular incident and because of what has occurred elsewhere in this land we will have to cut short and then uh, talk a little bit about that issue as well towards the end of our talk uh, so uh, today's lecture is actually going to concentrate on one incident and that incident took place in the final days of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I skipped over it intentionally because I was going to talk about it basically today uh, and that incident is called the incident of Thursday or the incident of the scrolls Qirtas uh, and Qirtas is like what they would write on the parchment so the papyrus or something they would write on this and uh, this incident involves a very controversial issue. That issue is about whether the Prophet Sallallahu intended to specify someone to be the Khalifa after him and in particular whether that person was Ali radiallahu anhu or not. And much as I personally do not like to go back into history and talk about why and what because in the end of the day what happened happened. Still this is an issue that every single Muslim that is involved with the religion at some point in his or her life is exposed to. And every single person at some point in his or her life finds some controversy where a person of the opposing side says, oh this happened, oh that happened, oh this happened, oh that happened. And therefore questions arise and so we have to go back to the very beginning which is uh, where the split occurred between the Sunni and the Shia and then talk about interpretations of specific incidents. Now, I have already mentioned one incident in the final months of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is the incident of the well of... the well of... yeah, but what is it called? That's correct. Ghadir Khum, the well of Khum. Ghadir Khum. The well of Khum. So, that incident is again a huge difference of interpretation. For the uh, Shia, this incident is considered to be of utmost importance. And for us, we affirm this incident 100%. It is in our books. We have no problems affirming it. But our interpretation is very different. And that is that when you put it into context, the Prophet was defending Ali and radiallahu anhu and he said that whoever irritates Ali irritates me, whoever uh, wants to protect me that, or, or whoever is my mawla, then Ali is also his mawla. So it's very clear that he was uh, criticizing those groups or those people that found fault with Ali and we have no problem in affirming any of this. And from our perspective, that was never intended to be the Khilafah. And what, is this, what demonstrates this is a number of things. We'll just mention two of them. Number one, for us, the most important thing over and over again is the fact that the very last days of his life, وسلم, he always emphasized Abu Bakr. He always mentioned Abu Bakr. And he insisted that Abu Bakr lead the Salah. For us, this is a huge issue. In fact, it is the decisive issue that never has the Prophet ﷺ commanded somebody to lead the Salah when he is alive and he is in the masjid. And he commands and he says, 
Allah and his messenger do not allow anyone other than Abu Bakr. And when they could not find Abu Bakr and even Umar is found, what does he say? He says, no, go and find Abu Bakr and tell him to lead the salah. So Umar has to break his salah. And Abu Bakr is put, for us these are not trivial matters. This is very significant. You cannot get more significant than this. So in light of all of these, we have to understand this particular incident that we're going to talk about today. And this incident is also authentic. And it is mentioned in our books of Bukhari and Muslim. Muttafaq Ali, completely authentic. And this incident, uh, the hadith occurs in bits and pieces. I'll mention the, the longer version that Ibn Abbas narrated. Uh, Thursday and what a Thursday it was, meaning what a bad Thursday it was. When the pain of the Prophet ﷺ increased, he said, bring me a book. And I shall write for you something that will never go astray. Bring me a qirtas, bring me a or a pen and paper, we would say in English. Bring me a pen and paper and I will write something that you will never go astray. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is overcome by pain. He is clearly suffering and we have the book of Allah and that is sufficient for us. Hasbuna kitab Allah. That we don't need anything other than the book of Allah. And some others said, it does not mention who is the one who said this in any book of hadith. Uh, it is not mentioned. Some others said that the Prophet ﷺ is speaking randomly because of his fever. Meaning, you know, when you have a strong fever, then you do not speak uh, properly. You're just speaking uh, things without understanding what he is saying. And we don't know who said this. None of the books of hadith mention who said this. Uh, from the Sunni tradition. Uh, the, the Shia tradition say this was also Umar. Uh, but from our books, this is not the case. We do not know who said this. Uh, and others said, confirm what he wants. Ask him. So they went to ask him. And they, the, uh, they differed amongst themselves, the Sahaba, what is to be done. And the lagat or the voices uh, went back and forth. And the Prophet ﷺ then said when he saw this differing, he said, قُومُ anni, Stand away or stand up from me, for it is not befitting that any ikhtilaf goes on in my presence. You should not be having any ikhtilaf in my uh, presence. And then Ibn Abbas says, later on, maybe the same day, maybe the next day, he advised them three things before he died. Number one, expel the mushrikun from Jazirat al-Arab, from the Arabian Peninsula. Number two, Treat the delegations that come to you in the same manner as I used to treat them. Any new delegation comes, treat them the same. And then one of the sub-narrators says, and I forgot what was the third one. I forgot what was the, the third one. Then Ibn Abbas said, what a calamity. The biggest calamity was what came between the Prophet ﷺ and the writing of that parchment. And this hadith is Bukhari and Muslim, muttafaq alayh. No ikhtilaf, it is authentic, it happened, we all agree, it happened. Okay, many issues to discuss, that will be our topic for today. And next Wednesday we'll come back and continue the election of Abu Bakr. Because this is one of the things that we need to talk about with the election of Abu Bakr. Uh, and today we'll talk about this, this issue, this controversy. And before we get to the actual controversy, there are some tangential benefits that Bukhari radiallahu anhu derived from this hadith. He narrated this hadith in seven different places in his book. Seven different places. And of the benefits that he derives, not related to the controversy, is the importance of writing down knowledge. The fact that the Prophet commanded them to write. So this shows we should be uh, writing down. Of them is the importance of treating delegations that come in a positive and a good manner. That when delegations come to learn Islam, to study Islam, we should be hospitable to them. And this was of the last pieces of advice that the Prophet uh, gave. Of the benefits we learn from this incident is that it is not good to differ and especially in front of uh, the Prophet it was haram to differ. So he said, you are, it is not befitting that differences occur in front of me. And so the Prophet always disliked differences and especially in front of him. And of the etiquettes that are mentioned by Imam al-Bukhari that we derive from this hadith is we should not sit too long when we visit the sick. Because in fact, it becomes a nuisance for the sick person. When we visit somebody, it should be for a quick period of time, short period, find out how they're doing and then move on. So we should not prolong our stay or else obviously it becomes uh, irritating uh, for the person who is sick. Also, as for the third point that, that the narrator forgot, Ibn Hajar compiles other hadith and he says, it seems to indicate one of two things. 
either the third point was to send Usama's army to uh, Sham, or that his grave should not become an idol, because both of these things are narrated in other versions that he said towards the end of his life, that the Usama's army should go, or that his grave should not become an idol. Now, let's get into the controversy. What is the controversy? The controversy is very simple. According to uh, the non-Sunni groups, the Shia groups, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly intended to write the wasiyah for Ali ibn Abi Talib. That he wanted to say the person in charge should be Ali ibn Abi Talib. Clear? That is the whole controversy. That because of Umar according to them, radiallahu anhu, this didn't happen. And Ibn Abbas is saying the biggest calamity, the calamity of Thursday was the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did not get to write down that Ali should have been the Khalifa. Ibn Abbas didn't say that. But this is the interpretation of the groups, that this was the point. Okay, so today we'll talk about this controversy from three perspectives. Number one, the first one, not perspectives, three questions. The first question, how do we understand Umar's stance? Because Umar said, we have enough, the book of Allah is enough for us. And he diverted the command away to not, uh, to not uh, execute the command. Our scholars have interpreted this in many different ways. And I spent a good amount of time today going over like at least seven, eight different classical scholars. And we'll go over these opinions very briefly. Uh, Imam al-Khattabi, one of the early scholars of Islam, died 388 Hijrah. He said that we cannot understand that Umar's statement was meant to imply that the Prophet was making a mistake. That's not what Umar meant. Rather, Umar radiallahu anhu saw the pain that the, that the, that the Prophet was in. That the high fever. And he feared that he might say something vague or ambiguous that the munafiqun might take advantage of. Additionally, he said, it is well known that the Sahaba would at times negotiate directly with the Prophet ﷺ if the circumstances required. Such as what happened at the camping of Badr, such as what happened at the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. And so Umar assumed this was one of those times you can go back and uh, forth. So this is Al-Khattabi's interpretation. Al-Maziri, uh, who died 453 Hijrah, and also an early commentator of Sahih Muslim, he says that, it appears the Prophet is giving a command, bring me something to write. But, he says, whenever somebody gives a command, there's always signs or indications that could be used to interpret that the command is not a command, but a request. And it must be assumed that Umar radiallahu anhu saw something that downgraded the command to a request, and therefore he wanted to go back and forth. And Umar made an ijtihad based upon his assumptions, and he will be rewarded for that. So according to Al-Mazidi and Al-Qurtubi, the famous scholar from Cordoba, Al-Qurtubi, for the one from Cordoba, uh, who died uh, 676 Al-Hijrah, he also said the same thing, that Umar radiallahu anhu must have seen something in the context, in the circumstance, that he felt that this was not a command. Uh, Ibn al-Jawzi as well, who died 595, and Ibn Hajar, they uh, narrated these positions and they agreed with them. That Umar ibn al-Khattab, out of care and concern, he saw something in the pain of the Prophet and he felt that now is not the time to get involved in any type of side issue. Let us leave the Prophet alone for his pain and suffering. So there's some circumstance that mitigates the uh, command. And Imam al-Nawawi, the famous Imam al-Nawawi, 676 Hijrah, he comments on this hadith and he says, scholars have unanimously agreed that this incident shows us the understanding of Umar and his excellence and his farsightedness. For he was fearful of something being written down that they could not perform and might have been punished for. And he took the generalities of the Quran that Allah clearly mentions in the Quran that Today I have perfected your religion for you. And that we have not left anything out of the Quran. And realizing that the religion was completed at that point in time, he wanted to protect the Prophet ﷺ and ease matters upon him, meaning his pain. And he wanted to protect the Ummah from misguidance. 
and this is also the position of Imam al-Bayhaqi who died 438, that Umar wanted to make things easy. He saw the suffering of the Prophet the pain, and he simply felt compassion and mercy for him. Now, the point here is that we really, and this is, there's no denying this, that we as Sunni Muslims look at this incident and we are biased. There's no denying this. Just like the other group is also biased. Our bias is what? Our bias is, in light of the track record of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, in light of the previous 20 years and all that he has done, and the next 13 years that he's also going to live and demonstrate, we have to understand what he has done in a positive light. Even if we don't understand the details, we weren't there, we don't know what Umar saw. But there must be a leap of faith, and knowing Umar's past, and knowing what he will do in the future, and knowing all of the ahadith that praise Umar ibn al-Khattab, of them is the Prophet said, if there were a Nabi after me, it would be Umar. Of them is that if shaitan sees Umar coming down a path, he will run away. Of them is that there were people before who were inspired in, in, in Ummas. If anybody in the future were to be inspired, it would be, it would be Umar. So, so many ahadith about Umar ibn al-Khattab that are praising him. And in light of his credentials and resume, we simply have to have a leap of faith. And we say, whatever was his motivation, there must have been a good reason for it. Even if we don't know the story. Now obviously, the other group does not have a positive view of Umar from day one. And so when you don't have a positive view of somebody, and that person does something ambiguous, something semi-vague, and subhanAllah, this is the reality of the world we live in. If you really and truly love somebody, and they make a little mistake, you'll forgive and overlook, correct? If it is a mistake, I'm just saying, you, um, ambiguous. And if you don't like somebody, and you have a long history, they do the same thing, what are you going to do? You're going to read in, and you're going to have a bad opinion. So the fact of the matter is that, and I'll be very honest here, Umar's actions are ambiguous. We really, personally, I cannot see something that is crystal clear. These explanations are good attempts, but in the end of the day, they're attempts. We were not there, these authors who explained it were not there. What did Umar see? What was the issue at hand that caused him to not immediately execute the command of the Prophet and I wasn't there, but my opinion of Umar ibn al-Khattab that we know from the seerah is that he must have had a very, very, very good reason. And he felt that reason was valid. And this is no doubt, I'll be honest, as you know, I'm not an uh, apologist, I don't sugarcoat, I, I call a spade a spade. This is a point of theology. We jump a leap of faith that Umar must have had a good reason. And those who don't believe this of Umar, they will not do the jump, okay? So this is the first question, why did Umar do what he did? The majority opinion, pretty much the standard opinion, he saw something, he felt the status of the Prophet's pain, he wanted compassion for the Prophet's him. he was worried that somebody might mislead or misguide whatever the Prophet might say in this time, so for whatever reason he simply just uh, turned it around. The second question, Regardless of what Umar's motivation is, what did, the, what did he actually want to write? What did he want to write? What was this command? Uh, so, in one version, we learn these three things that he wanted to say. Is this what he wanted to write? Many scholars say yes. And when he couldn't write it, he simply said it. Clear? That was the point, right? So these were the three. However, there's another opinion that... Uh, a number of early scholars, including Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who died 198 Hijrah, including Sufyan ibn Uyayna, that the Prophet actually wanted to write the exact opposite of what the other group says, and that is that he wanted to uh, dictate a letter that Abu Bakr as Siddiq should be the Khalifa after him, should be the in person in charge after him. The exact opposite. Where did we get this from? How could anybody say this? Because there are authentic narrations in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim that before he fell this sick. Now, what day did this take place, this incident of Umar? Thursday. Thursday. When did he pass away? Monday. Monday. Okay, so before he fell that sick, 
in the early part of his sickness, he said to Aisha that, and this hadith is also in Bukhari and Muslim, but it's not on Thursday. This is at least four days before. This is in the very beginning of his sickness. Remember I said in the story that Aisha came in and she said, oh, I have a headache, remember? And the Prophet said, oh, but I have the worst headache. That day, that in that incident, the Prophet said, call for me Abu Bakr, your father, and your brother, who is Aisha's brother. Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr. So that I may write a letter. Because I am worried that someone, meaning any person, may desire or aspire for something, meaning leadership, and say, I have more right. But Allah and His Messenger will refuse anyone other than Abu Bakr. Now, this hadith is also in Bukhari and Muslim, by the way, right? But it's not the Thursday incident, is it? This is before that. Maybe it was Tuesday or, 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 or Monday before. So this is way before by three days. Not way before, by a few days. And this hadith is also in Bukhari and Muslim. So one can argue the exact opposite. And this is also the position of Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way. Ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote a 10-volume book, Minhaj al-Sunnah al-Nabawiyyah, which is a book where he discusses these differences between uh, the two groups and he goes into 10 volumes of detail, and in this he clearly mentions that this letter, this is his opinion, this letter was a letter in favor of whom? Of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, okay? So this is the position that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, 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 had in his position, uh, and it was also supported by a number of early scholars, and Allah knows best, uh, it seems to be definitely more evidence than the other uh, opinion. But there are two opinions. So the first one was he wanted to write these three things down, which were already mentioned, right? Expelling the mushrikun from Jesus of the Arab and whatnot. And the second opinion, he wanted to write Abu Bakr's wasiyah. Okay? Obviously, from our perspective, we cannot follow the other position that he wanted to write the wasiyah for Ali because there's no evidence at all for that from our tradition. Now we get to the final question and then inshallah we'll conclude for today. And the final question is that can it be imagined that he wanted to write a wasiyah for Ali ibn Abi Talib and then uh, uh, that was supposed to be the, on the paper or on the qirtas? Can it even be logically or rationally or textually assumed from our perspective? To claim this is to claim that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam failed in his mission. Because regardless of what you want to say about Umar, Regardless of what you want to say, the undeniable fact that both groups affirm this incident occurred on Thursday. He passed away on Monday. That is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then early Monday. Three and a half full days along with Thursday evening. So four full days. And if the matter was of such importance then how could he have allowed four days to go by without saying anything about it? Regardless of your position, put Umar's position aside. Let's make that whatever you want it to be. We have a position, they have a position. Okay, khalas. Let's put that aside. The next issue then, or the question is then, why didn't he do something for four days? And who else is visiting him? You don't like certain people? Clearly, the people you favor and we also favor are also visiting him. Fatima is visiting him. Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu visiting him. All of them are visiting him. He does not say anything. So, clearly then, and uh, Ibn Hajar narrate, uh, points this out as well, that it is not possible that the Prophet would have left something so important without commenting on it for four days. And Imam al-Nawi uh, Imam al -Nawi comments that we have two options here. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to write something down, in which case, suppose a number of Sahaba diverted the writing, what should he have done? Was he ever stopped from doing what Allah told him to do? Did he ever just give up? No. So if Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him, and it wasn't written down, the only alternative is that that command was abrogated. Or else you are accusing the Prophet of failing his mission. Correct? There is no, or it wasn't a command from Allah, but rather it was an ijtihad from himself. And after what happened, happened with this incident, he changed his mind and said, no need to write it down. 
These are the only two options we have. Either Allah told him and then it was mansukh. Or he felt it should be done and then he changed his mind. Okay, no need to do it. In either case, if it was something of that importance, it would have been impossible not to do. Okay, so we say this incident, uh, the incident of uh, Al-Qirtas, the incident of Al-Qirtas, no doubt uh, it has been interpreted by different uh, people in different ways. From our perspective, uh, we assume that Umar ibn Khattab must have had some reason, firstly. Secondly, we clearly have evidences that what he wanted to write was other than what uh, is claimed that he wanted to write. Either it was these three commands or the exact opposite, and that is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And thirdly, regardless of the first two answers, what will we say to the fact that he didn't in the end write what you said he wanted to write? For four days, there's no indication whatsoever. And by the way, this is ignoring the fact that there's so many other evidences for As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So many evidences for the last, especially two weeks, and then even beyond this, right? Even we talked about Hajjatul Wada' as well. That the year that the Prophet could not go on Hajj, he actually sent Abu Bakr to perform the Hajj. And even when Ali radiallahu anhu was sent, Abu Bakr said, are you coming as the Amir or Ma'mur? And Ali said, no, I am not the Amir. Very explicit here. So in Hajj, which is what you delegate the person to do. And in Salah, he is delegating Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So for us, this is another track that clearly demonstrates that as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was what was intended by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with that, we will uh, pause and resume next uh, Thursday, next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala.